It's time for some more October birthday shout outs. These are shout outs to my Patreons, those who are able to help financially support the show over on Patreon. If you go over there, there's a $2 level that gets you ad free episodes, there's a $3 level that gets you an extra bonus episode and the ad free episodes, and then at the $5 level, you get stickers and a thank you card in the mail. And starting this month, most months, you will get another bonus episode. That will be me and another podcaster sitting down to talk about a case. And another way I say thank you to everybody who supports on Patreon, regardless of the tier, is a birthday shout out. So I want to say a very happy birthday to Gina, Carolyn, Caitlin, Sydney, Sandra, Maggie, Danielle, Connie, and Jenny. Thank you so much for your support. I hope you have a wonderful birthday. The month is about half over now, so hopefully if your birthday already passed, you had a great one. If it's coming up, you have amazing plans, and I hope you also enjoy getting the birthday horn. I used a happy birthday noise one time, and I have gotten resounding feedback that everybody loves the birthday horn. So I want to say a very happy birthday. In 1957, William and Margaret Patterson disappeared without a trace. Even their families couldn't agree what happened to them. The theories have evolved and changed in the last 64 years, but the case remains unsolved. I'm Charlie, and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. Thank you for spending some time with me this week. If this is your first time joining us, welcome, but I do feel like I need to give a preface, maybe even a disclaimer, that this is not the usual type of case I cover here. This is a missing persons case from the 1950s. It is a throwback to the types of cases I used to cover on my old podcast, Insight. Being that it's October and Halloween is coming up, I did want to do at least one case this month that has a little bit more of that spooky, mysterious element. But I'm not entirely into the whole ghostly, supernatural side of things, so the best I could do was an older case. I did talk about this case last year on a live stream, but those average about 30 viewers, so I know this is new content for the majority of you. Tonight, we're going to talk about the mysterious disappearance of William and Margaret Patterson. The Pattersons are a mysterious couple overall, not just because of their disappearance. They showed up in El Paso, Texas, put down some roots, and then told people next to nothing about themselves. Even their closest friends knew little about them. To give just one example, Margaret's age at the time she disappeared was reported as anywhere between 43 and 48, depending on the source, of course. And you will see it repeated today that she was in her mid-40s. But you know me, I love my archive records. I managed to find Margaret on the census. She was actually 52 years old in 1957. So her friends did not even know how old she was. So you are going to get a little bit of a head start on this case, ahead of what William and Margaret Patterson's friends knew about them, and ahead of what the police would uncover. We're going to go over all that is known about their past now at the start. William Patterson went by Pat as his nickname, and he grew up in Chicago. He left home at the age of 18 and started as a barker at carnivals. A barker is the person who tries to get people to come, try the activities, play the games, give their money over, which was a perfect job for Pat since he was a natural-born salesman. While with a traveling carnival, he met Margaret Matilda Kiefer, whose family called her Tilly. She grew up in a large family in Kentucky, and the couple probably met in Indiana. They married sometime around 1931, give or take a year or two, when they were about 27 years old. 
it said that the Kiefer family did not like Pat very much, and that may explain the family's estrangement that would come. In 1937, which would have been around six years into her marriage, Margaret visited her family for the last time. They spent the next 20 years not knowing where she was and not hearing a peep from her. Some of them assumed she had died, but she hadn't. A few years after Margaret's family saw her for the last time in 1940, the couple settled in El Paso, Texas. El Paso is a city on the border of Mexico, for those unaware of Texas geography. Pat would make some money during World War II by traveling to Mexico to buy nylon hose, and then he would resell it to women in the U.S. because during World War II, all nylon was diverted to war efforts, leaving a big gap in those who liked to wear stockings. Pat seemed to always make a little extra money here and there when he needed to, but his real passion was photography. He worked as a photographer for a while before he opened his own photo supply store in El Paso, which he so creatively named Patterson Photo Supply. The shop had hired help, of course, and Margaret worked on the business with Pat as a partner. Something the Pattersons did that was not entirely common for the time, they put everything in both of their names. We hear stories of women practically running their husbands' businesses behind the scenes, but without getting any credit or ownership. A famous example of this was Margaret Keene, whose husband Walter passed off her paintings as his own and made a fortune off of them. But that was not the dynamic here with the Pattersons. Margaret had as much control as Pat. And when it came to the finances, it could be argued she actually had more. She was frugal, to say the least, as they got their business off the ground. The only thing she splurged on in those early years were the couple's pets, who they treated like children. But after a few years of really scrimping and saving, the business started to turn a pretty good profit, and they loosened up their restrictions. By 1957, they were doing very well. They owned a nice home, they had a boat, two cars, mink coats, expensive jewelry, and Pat would travel to his favorite fishing spots in Florida and Mexico multiple times a year. Another area they spent money was on alcohol. Both Margaret and Pat had reputations for drinking too much. Pat would go down to Juarez in Mexico. He'd go to the nightclubs to drink, where he also happened to carry on extramarital affairs. Margaret was more of an at-home drinker. In spite of this, the couple seemed pretty comfortable with each other, and there were no rumors of this being an unhappy marriage. On March 4th, 1957, Pat invited two friends over to work on his boat with him, David Kirkland, who went by Kirk, and Cecil Ward. If you look this case up, you are going to see Kirk's name pretty regularly and consistently misreported as Doyle, but it was David, this name mix-up actually matters quite a bit to the understanding of this case, but we're going to get into that later. Cecil's wife also had come over to visit with Margaret while the men were in the garage tinkering. The three men worked on the boat, and before Kirk and Cecil left, they made plans to get together on March 5th, the next night, to finish the work they had started. But on the afternoon of the 5th, Cecil wasn't feeling so well, so he called the Pattersons to cancel the evening plans. On this phone call, he spoke with both Margaret and Pat, and everything from his point of view seemed fine. Pat even told him don't worry about it because he was sure that he and Kirk could get the boat work done themselves. The next morning, which would be March 6th, Cecil showed up at the garage he owned and he saw Pat's Cadillac parked out front. His employee, Nicholas Alvarez, told him that a man had dropped it off that morning. Nicholas said he saw the car pull up, so he went outside to see what was needed. The driver, who was not Pat, told him that Pat wanted the car checked over. 
Behind the Cadillac, a 53 or 54 Chevy pulled in. After Nicholas said they'd take a look at Pat's car, the man driving it got out and got into the passenger side of the Chevy, and they drove off. Nicholas did not recognize the man in the Cadillac, nor the one driving the Chevy. Later, when he would be asked to describe them, he said the man driving the Cadillac was dressed in a suit. He was of average height, in his early 30s, had a slim build, and he spoke with an American accent. As for the man driving the Chevy, Nicholas did not get as good of a look at him, but did say he was heavier set and he looked American. I assume by looked American, he meant as opposed to looking Mexican, being that they were in a border town. So basically, he meant the man was white. We're just going to ignore that race and nationality are not the same thing here. But anyway, Nicholas reported that the exchange was largely uneventful, and he didn't think much about it, and it didn't alarm Cecil either when he heard it. Pat had mentioned to him bringing the car in to be serviced. Not long after Cecil arrived at the garage and heard all of this, Kirk showed up. This was around 8 a.m. Kirk told Cecil that he had not gone to work on Pat's boat the night before either. He really just wasn't feeling up to it, so he made some excuse. But he had talked to Pat. Around 3 in the morning... Kirk woke up from a dead sleep to his phone ringing. He said it was Pat telling him that he and Margaret had gotten into some kind of argument over a picture that Pat had in his wallet. It has been heavily implied that the picture was of Pat's 20-year-old girlfriend in Juarez. Pat told Kirk that Margaret was drinking, and more than that, she was drinking to more excess than usual, so he was going to get her some help. They were leaving town to go get treatment for her elsewhere so that it would be discreet. Pat asked Kirk to do him a favor, or rather a bunch of favors. He said he had his Cadillac going to Cecil's garage, and he needed Kirk to go there, let Cecil know what work needed to be done, and then, in the glove box, he would find all the keys Kirk would need to access the car, Pat's house, and Patterson's photo supply. Pat needed Kirk to take care of everything while Pat and Margaret were away. The car issues were the minor maintenance and cleaning issues that Pat had already mentioned to Cecil before that, so that wasn't what was weird. What was weird was that a mystery man dropped the car off and that Kirk was the one getting and then giving the instructions. Why didn't Pat call Cecil directly? And why hadn't Pat called the manager of his photo supply store, who he had day-to-day dealings with, and let him know what was going on? Instead, Pat called Kirk, someone who was not normally involved in these various tasks, instead of calling one or more of the people who were involved in it. Another odd thing to me with this is the timeline. This was a 3 a.m. phone call, so that gives me the impression that the issue was urgent and they were leaving town right away or else he would have just waited till a normal hour to call. But the couple had two cars and both cars were left behind. How did they leave town at 3 a.m. without their cars? There was train service to El Paso in 1957, and I honestly could not find a train schedule for El Paso for 1957, but generally speaking... Trains wouldn't have left until 5 or 6 a.m. at the earliest for the commuters. So if that is accurate, and they would have had to leave when the commuter trains did, why didn't Pat wait until then to call Kirk? And then there is the mystery man with the Cadillac. When did Pat arrange to have someone bring it into the shop, and who was that person? Why not leave it at the house and ask Kirk to drive it over if it was so important to involve Kirk in everything. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But we are going to roll with it anyway because that's what literally everyone else did. The only person who expressed any hesitation here with this official story was Cecil. He wondered about the things we're wondering about. But he trusted his friend Kirk, and he was just going to wait for Pat and Margaret to come back and explain everything. 
Ten days after Cecil last spoke to Pat and Margaret on the phone, Pat and Margaret's personal and business accountant, Herbert Roth, received a telegram supposedly from Pat. Herb was himself rather relieved to hear from them. It was just a few days after Pat and Margaret had left town that Art Marino, the store manager, called Herb. Art told him that the Pattersons left without notice or making any arrangements for paying the bills. They had invoices that needed to be paid, and Herb, as the accountant, was the only other person authorized to sign the checks. Art said all he knew was that Kirk showed up one day with the keys and told him that he, Kirk, was supposed to be running the store. Kirk had plenty of experience in the business since he was the manager of another area photo supply store called Duffy's, so he was definitely capable of doing this. But without actual permission to sign checks, Kirk couldn't do what they needed done. Now, Herb, he could sign the checks, but he wasn't in the practice of managing the day-to-day transactions of the store. He hadn't even seen Pat in a few months. They did have more regular phone contact to discuss things, but honestly, the regular operations were not anything Herb dealt with. He didn't know which invoices Pat would want paid. He didn't know if any of them needed to be disputed or paid next month or any of that. He didn't know anything he needed to know to pay the bills. So when the telegram showed up on March 15th with explicit instructions, Herb was very glad for it. The telegram basically laid out how to handle the Patterson's obligations while they were away, both business and personal. The telegram said they would be gone for nine months, and they wanted Herb to rent out their house for that duration. The letter went on to give instructions for running the business in Pat and Margaret's absence, and that included that Kirk was to continue managing it. The telegram closed with the instructions to just handle everything as quietly as possible. This telegram, according to all of the sources from 1957, 58, 59, and so on, was signed Pat. But more modern accounting say that it was signed W.H. Patterson, which would be pretty interesting since Pat's middle name was Durrell, so his name was actually W.D. Patterson. Messing up his own name makes it definitely sound like someone else wrote this telegram. However, like I said, none of the reporting at the time said the telegraph was signed incorrectly. It all explicitly says it was closed out with simply the name Pat. Regardless of how it was signed, Herb and Kirk did exactly what was in the note, including keeping things hush-hush. Whenever anyone would ask where the couple was, the answer was on a long vacation. When they didn't show up in Wisconsin for a planned boat show with friends, when they missed the photography convention that they had booked a hotel room for, when all of these things happened and people asked where they were, the answer was on vacation. Kirk ended up hiring a janitorial service to come in and clear out the Patterson's home to get it ready for renters. The cleaner, whose name was R.G. Prince, said that the house was dusty and there were dirty dishes on the table and in the sink. A skillet and a pot were dirty on the stove and the fridge was full of spoiled food. In the bedrooms, none of the beds were made and there were women's garments on one of the beds, a nightgown, stockings, slip, garter, and underwear. This really did not look like someone who planned to go away for a while and intended to come back. They would have come back to an absolutely disgusting scene with all the rotting food. So this they're on vacation story did not ring true for Prince, but he cleaned up as he was hired to do and the renters moved in. As for the store, Kirk took over running the store in addition to running Duffy's photo service shop. He earned $900 a month in salary for his work at Patterson's. 
That would be about $8,000 today, so a pretty good income, but how he was managing two full-time jobs seems unclear. A few months into this arrangement, Kirk bought out Duffy's photo service when Duffy himself decided to retire as his wife was ill. In July 1957, Kirk moved to Lubbock, Texas, which was where the headquarters were. He would come back to El Paso every few weeks to deal with things at Patterson's, still making his full salary just to show up for a few days a month, which is nice work if you can get it. Kirk was not the only one who seemed to be benefiting from the Pattersons being away. They had left behind two cars, one of which was used by the business for making deliveries, and the other, the Cadillac, was picked up by Kirk after it sat at Cecil's garage for a few weeks and given to Herb Roth, the accountant, for his own use. Over the next few months, Cecil Ward really wondered about Pat and Margaret. He started asking around to see if anyone had heard from them or knew when they would be back. He had never known both of them to be gone for an extended period at the same time. And actually, it was rather intentionally the opposite. One time, Margaret and Pat went away together for two weeks. When they got back, Margaret said they should never have both been gone from the business quite that long, and they were never going to do it again. And they didn't until now. And that was just two weeks. So now here we are with weeks and weeks going by without word from them, and Cecil was getting quite suspicious. Duffy Sasser, the original owner of Duffy's Photo Service, did tell Cecil that he had heard from Pat both in March and then again in June, and that everything was fine. But he was the only one who had heard anything since the telegram to Herb. On August 15th, 1957, unable to talk himself out of his suspicions a minute longer, Cecil went to the sheriff and reported the couple missing. And the story immediately hit the local papers. A prominent businessman and his wife, who everyone heard were on vacation, were actually missing. This would go on to be front-page news in El Paso for the better part of a year. Pat's family was tracked down in Chicago and notified that he was missing. They, too, hadn't heard from him or from Margaret, but they had a response that we don't often get from families. They told the police, don't waste your time looking for Pat. From their 50 years of experience with him, he did things like this. He'd drop off the face of the earth, travel off somewhere, and then reappear out of the blue. To them, that seemed like the likely scenario. And while that had been true of Pat in his teens, even through his 30s, it hadn't been like that for a while. After he and Margaret moved to El Paso 17 years before, they stayed there. One or both of them would travel, sure, but they were dedicated to their business. No one in El Paso knew them to be gone this long before, so to the police, it didn't look like a waste of time. Worst case scenario, they would find the Pattersons and confirm they were okay. So the next step was to find Margaret's family and see if they had heard from her. And I don't think the investigators realized how long that would take them to find Margaret's family. Because of how little she told anyone about her past and the fact that she had no contact with them for 20 years, it actually took several months to find even one of her sisters. And when that sister was contacted the police found that Margaret's family was a bit more alarmed than Pat's was to hear she was missing. And since some of them had already accepted that Margaret had probably died years before, I imagine it was a little surreal for them to be notified of her disappearance. While they were trying to track Margaret's family down, of course they checked bank records. The couple had touched absolutely none of their money in the time they were away, They had no large cash withdrawals before they went missing that they could have used to live off of. 
Her broth said he had not been contacted by them asking for any money to be sent, and he hadn't sent them any money. The only money spent in the time they were gone were normal business and house expenses, which he could account for. Inquiries were made at various hospitals around Texas because Kirk said Pat was taking Margaret away for treatment for her alcoholism. None of the public hospitals had a record of her, and the private hospitals were paid a lot of money to not reveal such things. So it took some time before that lead could be completely ruled out. It did seem like a long shot, though, because these private hospitals that are paid to keep quiet like to get paid, and there were no signs that anyone had paid a hospital bill. Another lead that was followed up on was the telegram that Herb had received. The police were able to see that it was sent from Dallas, Texas, but there was little to go on there. The telegram was actually sent from a pay station. What this meant was it wasn't written down by the sender and then handed to the operator to transmit it over the wires. If it was, they would have a handwriting sample of the person who wrote it out. Possibly they would have a description of the person from the telegraph office. Instead, this was called in over the phone at a pay station near the Love Field Airport. It certainly would have been easy enough for Pat to send off that telegram, and then the couple could have hopped on a plane somewhere. So that lead was followed up on. Even if we assume Pat and Margaret found some way from El Paso to Dallas, there's no indication of where they stayed in the weeks between leaving and then sending the telegram or how they would have bought plane tickets without any obvious source of money. A few weeks after the Pattersons were reported missing, even though most people were still sticking with the they probably left on their own theory, there was a cause for alarm that did shift some people's opinions. And that was when the couple who was renting their home noticed a cat in their yard, and the cat looked to be in rough condition. They took him to the vet immediately, where the vet recognized him to be Margaret's beloved nine-year-old cat named Tommy. When Margaret and Pat would leave town for any length of time, They didn't do what most of us do, which is have a neighbor kid come and feed the cat and scoop the litter box. Instead, they would always pay to board Tommy with the vet. They spared no expense when it came to Tommy's care or on the care of any of the various pets they had over the years. Leaving town without making arrangements for Tommy and leaving him to fend for himself was just not something either Pattersons would have done, particularly not Margaret. When the vet checked Tommy over, it was pretty clear he had been out on his own for a while. The animal hospital did get Tommy back to health, and they held on to him, sure that Margaret would eventually make contact about his care. But she never did. Meanwhile, the police were checking locations in Florida and Mexico where the couple spent time. They made contact with a woman named Estefana Morphine, who was Pat's girlfriend in Juarez. They asked her if she knew of any reason Pat would leave. She said she actually hadn't seen Pat since March, but shortly before Pat disappeared, he did get in a bar fight when he tried to buy her a drink at the club where she worked, and the bartender refused to serve her. They just had a policy against letting patrons buy employees drinks. Pat got angry that they wouldn't give her the drink, and a fight broke out. That incident seemed inconsequential, but the next thing Estefana said seemed a lot more interesting. She told the investigators that she saw Pat on March 6th, the day a stranger dropped his Cadillac off at the shop. She said Pat told her that he would have to disappear quickly once They found him, but gave no indication of who they were. She said Pat was alone, but that is to be expected. He wouldn't have brought Margaret with him while he was visiting his girlfriend. But Pat didn't give any indication to Estefana where Margaret was. I will note that Estefana later recanted this account. 
Why she would have lied about it happening in the first place is unknown. And so I'm going to put a big question mark on this because maybe it's the recantation that is the lie. We will get more into this later, so let's just stick with our timeline for now. In November 1957, Pat's family in Chicago said they would consider asking for a court of inquiry over the disappearances if the couple didn't show back up by December. That would be nine months since leaving, which was how long they said they would be gone in the telegram. They still believed Pat was just off somewhere. December came and went without another word from Pat or Margaret. So the family was asked again in January 1958 about having this court of inquiry. They said they had actually changed their minds. They were still going to just wait for Pat and Margaret to come back on their own or get in touch because they were sure everything was fine and this was just a waste of time. But not everyone was as patient as Pat's family. The people trying to manage Pat and Margaret's financial interests, for instance, were hitting some roadblocks without them there and without someone clearly in authority. So it was in early 1958 that the courts put the business in receivership so it could continue to function. Her broth, the accountant, was named as the receiver and would essentially be running the business. At this point, Kirk resigned his position at Patterson Photo Supply. He had already taken a pay cut after the Pattersons were reported missing. And now that he wasn't the boss, he was just going to move on to focus solely on Duffy's, which was the business he owned. Eventually, the decision to hold a court of inquiry was taken out of the family's hands. The police were running out of leads and they needed some help, so the court scheduled an inquiry for early June 1958. Now, a court of inquiry has the powers of a court, so it can hear testimony, look over evidence, and even subpoena people to testify, things the police cannot do. The subpoenaing power was pretty big because not everyone agreed to speak to the police, or to be as forthcoming with the investigators as they had hoped. And some of the people weren't willing to come to the court of inquiry either. Kirk was one of them. He only showed up because they subpoenaed him and he wasn't really given a choice. Shortly before the June inquiry was held, and after it was made public that it was happening, a letter from Pat was sent to Pat's attorney, David Smith. What a coincidence. After over a year of silence, Pat decided to get in touch right before court. The letter was written much like a will, saying who should get which assets the couple had. It made it clear that neither Pat nor Margaret intended to come back, and they didn't want any of their wealth that they left behind. Among the divisions, the letter said to donate the contents of Margaret's personal bank account, and then it said to split most of the other things four ways. One quarter to her broth, the accountant, one quarter to Art Marino, the store employee, one quarter to Doyle Riley, who was a friend of Pat's who lived in New Mexico, and the last quarter would be evenly divided amongst the other employees of the store. So this is where Kirk's first name comes into play. I mentioned this confusion earlier in the episode. If you think his name is Doyle, it's really easy to mix him up with Doyle Riley mentioned in this letter. Then it looks like Kirk had quite a motive here. He was the last person to hear from Pat. He took over managing his business, and now he would get a quarter of the couple's significant assets. But this wasn't Kirk. Doyle Riley's an entirely different person, and David Kirkland, Kirk, didn't really benefit through this letter. To be fair, in the end, no one did. The letter was signed W.D. Patterson, but nowhere was Margaret's signature. She was co-owner of everything. So even if a non-notarized, non-witnessed letter like this was legally valid, which it was not, but let's say it was, Without Margaret's signature, it was absolutely worthless. 
This letter also said that Pat and Margaret were going to be out of the country by the time the letter arrived, which tracked since it was mailed from Laredo, Texas, another border town. They could have just walked across the bridge and they'd be out of the country. There was an investigation in Laredo, both on the Texas side and Nuevo Laredo on the Mexican side, but it didn't provide any solid leads, just a few vague sightings that could not be verified. So the court of inquiry continued with this new letter as evidence. The testimony given was pretty much everything we have covered already. For the people of El Paso listening to it in real time, a lot of this information was brand new, particularly about the Patterson's past. It seems so interesting to me that the Pattersons did not tell anyone about their lives, yet, as far as anyone could tell, they also had nothing to hide. They did have a somewhat unconventional life, traveling with the carnival, but little else was there that someone would try to keep secret. No criminal past or anything like that as far as has been uncovered. So you almost have to wonder why they were not just private about their past, but secretive about it when there was nothing to hide. So we have covered most of the info that came out in court, but I do want to hit a couple important points. One was Duffy Sasser's testimony. This is the man who claimed he heard from Pat while he was missing both in March 1957, shortly after he disappeared, and then again three months later in June. Duffy admitted in court that he had actually made this up. Pat had never contacted him. However, he said he was doing what he thought Pat wanted him to do. Several weeks before Pat and Margaret went missing, Duffy and Pat made plans to attend that photography convention in April. Later, Pat said he might not make it to the convention and that if he didn't, to give everyone the idea everything was fine. So when Pat did leave and didn't make it to the convention, Duffy thought he was doing what Pat asked, telling people, oh, I just heard from him the other day, everything's fine. So now we have Duffy's stories of contact thrown out, and we need to focus on the two pieces of correspondence that they did have. One was the vague telegram that was sent two weeks after the couple supposedly left town. It's impossible to verify if Pat sent this or not. The other, the more important one, was the May letter that came right before the inquiry. If it was from Pat, it was proof of life, and if it wasn't from Pat, it was proof of a cover-up. Herbert Roth testified that he believed the May letter was valid. The writer referred to him as Herb, not Herbert, and the store manager as Art, not Arthur. So it showed that the person writing the letter knew they used these nicknames. Herb also said that Pat had always mentioned dividing the business pretty much the same way it was in the letter. That was part of his retirement plan. Yes, Pat had another three years or so before he planned to retire, but the split was in line with previous decisions. And the list in the letter of the various assets and where they should go, that was sufficiently detailed that Herb believed only Pat or someone who knew him well could have written that letter. Pat's attorney, the one who received the letter, also thought it was from Pat. Though the body of the letter was typed, it was hand-signed, and the handwriting looked like Pat's signature. Handwriting experts did study the letter, and they compared it to known samples from checks that Pat had written in the past. The consensus was that the signature was very close, but there were some discrepancies. These discrepancies were not huge, and they could be explained away, but they could also be a sign that someone traced or just made a really good imitation of Pat's signature. So they determined it was inconclusive, which was so, so helpful. Now, if it was Pat who sent that letter, it showed up right before the inquiry, so it would be clear he was keeping an eye on what was happening in El Paso. Was he somehow getting the El Paso newspapers wherever he was, or was someone in contact with him? 
Now, if Pat did not send the letter and someone forged it, that person was someone close to Pat. That person would have to know Pat's friends, his possible retirement plans, and even something like Margaret having a private bank account. That was uncommon for wives in the 1950s. This person would also need a copy of Pat's signature as a reference to copy or trace. This all pointed towards if the letter wasn't written by Pat, it was written by someone very close to him. The court of inquiry ended up essentially shrugging its legal shoulders and closed with no conclusion. It was in March of 1964, seven years after their disappearance and with no additional communication, the Pattersons were declared dead and their estate settled. By this point, though, the active investigation was long over. After the court couldn't develop any new leads, what were they going to do? There was no evidence a crime took place. There was some thin evidence that at least Pat was out there living his best life somewhere, and there was just nowhere else to look without more tips coming in. The case was ice cold in 1984 when a man named Reynaldo Nangari came forward with a statement. He said he had been in the Patterson's house shortly after the couple disappeared. He worked as a caretaker of some sort. Reynaldo said he basically walked into what looked to him like a crime scene in the garage. He said there was blood in there and what looked like a piece of scalp on Pat's boat. He also saw one of Pat's friends or associates take bloody sheets out of the home. Rather than report this, Reynaldo helped clean up the mess. I would be interested in what Prince, the other house cleaner, has to say about this or would say about this. I'm pretty sure he has since died, but he noted the beds weren't made when he went into the house. By not made, did he mean the blankets were askew, or did he mean the beds didn't even have sheets on? Because if they didn't have sheets on, that may back up Reynaldo's statement. The police do have Reynaldo's statement on file, but the name of the person who was allegedly removing sheets from the house has not been released. By the time this lead was made public in 2005, Reynaldo had long since passed, dying in a car accident in 1986. At the time he made the statement, though, Reynaldo was asked why he waited 27 years to come forward, and he said that he was undocumented at the time, and he was afraid he would be deported if he went to the police. I usually do not put a lot of stock in old witness statements like this, but I will say Reynaldo's does track if the couple was killed. We know it had to have been by someone they knew, employing an undocumented immigrant who couldn't take the risk of going to the police and have him help clean up the house makes sense if you're covering something up. But if the blood evidence was cleaned up, that's about the only thing cleaned because Prince saw a real mess when he went into the house Later, dirty dishes were around and there was rotten food in the fridge. There is another little bit of information that came out later from Jerry Cash, who was a neighbor of the Pattersons. It's possible this tip was given early on in the investigation and just wasn't significant enough to come up in the reporting. Jerry was a neighbor of the Pattersons and brought some Girl Scout cookies over to sell on March 5th. Jerry said the couple kept to themselves mostly, and she had actually never spoken to Margaret before. This is really the only indication I've heard of the Pattersons keeping to themselves. Most of the reports are about all the friends they had and places they went. But people are different in different situations, so they may just not have been friends with their neighbors. But it's important to note that Jerry hadn't spoken to them before, so she didn't have a baseline for how they normally acted or responded to people knocking on their door. So Jerry said that Pat seemed unhappy that she was there and Margaret seemed upset. So it was just overall an uncomfortable situation for her. She left the cookies with Margaret and then went home. Now, this doesn't add very much to the story except to say the couple was in a bad mood, which we already know from Kirk's statement. According to Kirk, Pat called him at 3 a.m. to tell him that the couple had been arguing. 
So that is the information and the background on the case. And in an ode to the format of Insight, Thinking Sideways, and all the other original Unsolved Mystery-style podcasts, we are now going to get into the theory section. I know the trail went cold is still standing, and Robin does this format on his show, so definitely a shout-out to The Trail Went Cold for being one of the OG Unsolved Mystery-style shows. So here we are in our theory section. Theory number one is the couple left on their own, and that is certainly what the telegram and the letter want us to believe, and it's a theory Pat's family firmly believed for many, many years. Pat and Margaret could have just decided to abandon everything for fun, but a more specific theory came up in 2005. An El Paso County Sheriff said, looking back, he thinks they may have been Cold War spies. Perhaps Pat's various trips to Mexico to buy nylons during the war helped him make some connections, and then after the war, he started spying for the other side, for the Russians. And there are a few points in this favor. For one, the couple did have very limited contact with their family in this time frame, though Pat did see his father occasionally. They didn't tell their friends much about their lives outside of surface-level stuff. I mean, I said it was odd that they didn't tell people about their past, even though there was nothing there that looked worth hiding. Well, maybe the police in the late 1950s didn't actually uncover everything there was to uncover about them. Pat's business associates would say he would leave for a few weeks without telling anyone at work where they could contact him. Margaret would stay behind and run the business, but she would also not tell anyone specifically about where Pat was. His explanations would be vague, like he was out fishing. And when Pat got his start in El Paso, he was a street photographer. People saw him take pictures of trains carrying military supplies and even photograph Army Post Fort Bliss. If anyone knows a photographer, professional or hobbyist, you know they take pictures of pretty much everything. So wouldn't that make him almost a natural spy? Pretty handy to have around where he had an excuse to take these pictures of military assets. As the theory goes, Pat and Margaret got up and left everything behind because, for some reason, their handlers told them they had to move. An FBI agent actually did look through the file when this came up in the media and told everybody that, on the FBI side at least, there was no indication that the couple was suspected of being spies, and there's nothing in the newspapers of the time even bringing this up. The spies on the run theory seems to be pretty new in this case. So let's move on to a much older theory, and that is the foul play theory. There are a couple of scenarios here, but I think we can largely rule out stranger involvement. This was not a ransom kidnapping of a rich businessman or a robbery gone wrong. All of the evidence points towards if it was murder, the killer was someone the couple knew. Kirk being the last person to allegedly hear from Pat, he did seem suspicious. The phone call he supposedly got didn't make a ton of sense, which we went over already. He did benefit financially, drawing a decent salary while he was managing the store. The tone of the court of inquiry made me think the prosecutor either suspected him or suspected he knew more than he was saying. A lot of people looking back also suspect him based on the May letter that sounded like he was getting a lot of property and money. That's because they think his name is Doyle, not David. Doyle Riley is the one who got a quarter share of the business, the couple's vacation cabin, various tools. He got Pat's boat and the Cadillac. So he gained a lot, but Kirk really didn't benefit from the letter much at all. Had it been accepted legally, Herb Roth, the accountant, did pretty well based on the contents of that letter because he would have gotten a quarter of the business. And he testified that the four-way split matched Pat's retirement plans. So if someone other than Pat wrote the letter, they would need that information, and Herb had that information. As the personal and business accountant, Herb could back up whatever was in that letter, saying, oh yeah, Pat told me about this. And he would also know 
fine details about Pat and Margaret's assets. It's also possible the manager of the store, Art Marino, would have known some of this. After all, he was being trained to take over the business when Pat retired. He also would have done well in the letter had it been accepted. In addition to his share of the business, he would have gotten the couple's house and all of the furniture in it. How Art would fit in with the phone call to Kirk, the dropping off the Cadillac, or any of that is not clear. And he's really only mentioned as a quote-unquote suspect because he would have benefited. It seems none of the players really fit completely, so you have to wonder if this was some sort of conspiracy between more than one of them. Maybe people not in the letter were also involved, like the owner of the competing Duffy's photo service. He admitted he lied about having heard from Pat, which delayed Cecil in reporting him missing. Some people had a lot to gain in this. In the end, most of them ended up getting nothing. But perhaps this was some grand conspiracy. However, there's another foul play theory here, and that is that one spouse killed the other and then went on the run. Margaret would have known all of the information in both the letter and the telegram, and she would know how to imitate her husband's signature. Maybe their argument over Pat's younger girlfriend escalated after he got off the phone with Kirk. Margaret would have then sent all the correspondence in Pat's name only, so it would look like he was the one alive and moving around Texas. To me, though, it seems a lot more likely the other way around, if this theory is what we're going with. During an argument, Pat killed Margaret and then called Kirk to set up this we're going away for a while story. Instead, he hid Margaret's body somewhere and he took off. That was something Margaret's sisters believed was possible, particularly after that letter showed up with only Pat's signature on it and not Margaret's. I think it's possible Pat's girlfriend in Mexico did see him on the 6th, like she originally said. But she recanted after she put two and two together and realized her statement actually implicated Pat in Margaret's disappearance. Or maybe he contacted her again and asked her to recant in order to protect him. But we're still left with the question about how did Pat get away? The only scenario I can really come up with is that the murder took place late on the night of March 5th, before the phone call to Kirk. Pat transported Margaret's body to a dump site in the Cadillac. Then he paid someone to bring the Cadillac to the garage to be fixed and cleaned. The person may not have known Pat well, but figured it was some easy money. Then Pat left on foot and headed south towards Juarez. It is only a two-and-a-half-hour walk. He wouldn't have needed transportation to get down there to then hide out, lay low for a little bit, talk to his girlfriend before he went back to Dallas to send that telegram, making it seem like everything was fine and to buy himself some more time. Then when he heard about the inquiry, he decided to send a letter in to give evidence that he and Margaret were alive and well and living somewhere else of their own free will. And once he settled their estate, there would be no reason for anyone to go looking for him again. Under the scenario, Pat lived happily ever after under an assumed name, almost surely in Mexico, making money however he could, and no one was looking for him because there was no solid evidence a crime had taken place. So this case is technically not closed, but obviously it's not being investigated. Pat and Margaret, if either of them lived past March 5th, 1957, they would both be dead now anyway. So there is really no point in giving you who to call if you know anything about this case, because you probably don't, and it wouldn't really matter at this point anyway. But if you do have any theories or thoughts on this, you can reach out to me, crimelinespodcast at gmail.com, or just search for Crime Lines Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, and you can contact me there. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. 
Crime Lines is also on YouTube, where I post two to three true crime videos a week, including an occasional after show where we go over any visuals from that week's podcast episode. Crime Lines is also on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. And if you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an occasionally funny history, mystery, and true crime podcast that I co-created and write for. 